Good evening, I'm Ed Gordon. Tonight we talk with two men who helped write one of the biggest pages in black musical history. Earl Van Dyke and Thomas Beans Bowles have been called two of the men most responsible for the success of Motown Records. We'll talk with these gentlemen about the glory days of Motown and it's about Diana Ross, Barry Gordy, Marvin Gaye, or any other favorite Motown memory. Gentlemen, thanks very much for being here tonight. And I saw both of you laughing <laughs> when we talked about the success of Motown Records. And certainly we all know the part that Barry Gordy played in building it, but there were the foot soldiers, if you will, and certainly you two uh, are, are one of them, uh, the cornerstones, if you will. Mr. Van Dyke, you were called the architect of the Motown sound by many. You and what you called the Funk Brothers made the sound that uh, so many people loved and enjoyed. That's correct. That is really what kind of feeling do you get from that? Well, I never thought that when we were doing the records that it would be, uh, here we are 20 years later and it sounds better to me now than it ever did before. And especially when we were in the studio recording, you know, we had no idea. You said, a uh, quote from you in uh, Where Did Our Love Go, which was a book written by Nelson mm -hmm. George last year. In the early days, we were a family. It really was a, a feeling of family back then, wasn't it? Yes, it was, because we were very, very close. Well, we didn't have but uh, two buildings, I think it was, right? One building. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> One building. And so, uh, and then we branched out to two. But we used to do things like uh, on the weekend, we would go to uh, maybe to uh, Barry's secretary's house and stay there all weekend, and we would maybe play poker, quarter limit. I mean, it's very, very close, you know, and we... One other thing, and then we'll get some of Mr. Bowles' memories. When you looked around at that time and saw a Smokey Robinson, a Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, Temptations, did you know, I mean, really, did you know that you had something special there? Well, coming from the point of working in the studio, we really didn't come in contact with them that much. We come in contact more with Stevie and Marvin because they were musicians. But like, uh, the only time we see Smokey and the rest of them, like, well, Smokey was a producer, but the other artists, we never saw them. Because like, we would make the tracks and then they would come in and dub after we leave. Now, Mr. Bowles, you had an interesting setup with Motown Records. You signed on as an artist in 62, a saxophonist. Yeah, yeah. But then you became road manager for one of the most certainly memorable things that Motown has left us, the Motown Review. You were the babysitter, if you will, of all these people. What, what was that like? Well, uh, I was the creator of Motown Review. Mm -hmm. It was first called the Motown Special. That was my assignment when I first went to Motown, was to try to, try to pull something together. They had a few shows, but they weren't going like uh, Barry had a feel for. So he hired me because I'd been in the, involved at the shows with the Flame Show Bar for so long. And I had quite a bit of experience in pulling the show together. So I spent six months developing first the Motortown special. And uh, unfortunately, I got hurt on the tour. And it ended up being the Motortown Review. The idea was to have the Motortown special, the gospel train, a jazz liner. And out of each one of these, you pull the, the, the top acts and put together a Motortown review and make a variety show out of it. That was the real plan. It not, never got any farther than the Motortown review. But you had so many people on that thing, a lot of <laughs> egos, I'm sure. Not at that stage. Not at no. that stage. But first of all, uh, to reflect back on what Earl said, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't just the artist that was a family. The whole operation was a family. We had, we had a, a, a rapport that no other organization I've ever been associated with has ever had. That includes fraternalism. I, this thing was so tight. I mean, you couldn't even, nobody couldn't even talk about another artist outside of Motown, mm -hmm. you know, without sure. having some real problems, because we loved everybody. Now, the first artist was Marv Johnson. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got my first problem. I was a road manager there. And uh, as he developed, uh, I came back home and uh, uh, went into the office because Ms. Edwards needed, was, was glad of uh, the, way, the work that I had on. Let me, let me see if I can get you to share some memories about some of the people who mm -hmm. went on and subsequently became superstars. Marvin Gaye, you had a close relationship with yes, Marvin Gaye. Yes, very, very close. Very close. Marvin and I were... 
Well, I guess I, 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 he, he kind of respected me for being able to tell him a few things. And uh, he was a young guy, you know, and he was confused. He, had, he was doing a lot of things, and he wasn't happy with everything that, had, that he was doing. He wasn't pleased with the money he was getting. He wasn't pleased, he, he wasn't pleased with his life. He had turmoil. And uh, we couldn't pinpoint it at that time. We just said, oh, well, he, he'll be all right, you know. And we kept working because he took all his anguish out in music. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he did a lot of things. But see, he had a fear of the stage. Nobody never knew. He didn't like to perform. Mm -hmm. He would stay in the studio all the time, but he did not like to go out on the stage. And he definitely didn't like to dance. True. He wanted to be a, a balladeer. And that wasn't selling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me ask you, uh, Mr. Van Dyke, now, you and we mentioned the, the Funk Brothers, uh, James Jamerson and uh, Benny Benjamin, and, and, and you folk uh, just laid down what became gospel at that time in the 60s. I mean, that was the sound. One of the things that I find interesting in, in doing the reading that I did, because I read a number of books last year on Motown, was that you all kind of saw yourself as the musicians, at that time, True. and then there were the artists, like you were saying, right. you know, like the Supremes. I mean, they were that. There was a difference there in your minds, where was there not? True. Uh, that's uh, the only thing I, you know, I was just wrapped up into the music thing. Now, this, the funny thing was at the time, Beans and I were working together with the Lloyd Price Orchestra, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I never will really forget. Well, the first act that I ran into was Smokey Robinson and the Miracle. And they came out, you know, and we, I know we laughed at them. We really <laughs> did, sincerely, you know. Because we laughed at the music, the way the music was written and everything. But by uh, being professional musicians, what we did was we just took the music and rearranged it so it sounded right. Now, we had a 14-piece orchestra, and maybe they came out there with a six-piece arrangement. Okay. You, know? you laughed at, and, and, and let, let it be known, everybody laughed at the Supremes for a long time, did, when they were the primates and they couldn't buy a hit. What about the Supremes? Now, a lot of people want to know about Diana Ross and what she was like. And Mary, we had Mary Wilson on some months ago, and she came on and talked about her book and, and talked about uh, Diana and Flo and everybody. What were they like? Well, I didn't really come in contact with them until we started doing things like I went out. We went to Europe, right, because I actually, Kim Weston and my group, we pioneered uh, Europe so the Motown Review could come over. But other than that, as far as the Supremes, uh, I guess Beans could tell you more about that than I could. Because, see, he was in management, and he, uh -huh. he really came in closer contact with them. Okay, I've heard about you musicians, though. Those were three pretty ladies. I bet you know more than you're telling. We'll go no. to the phone lines right now. <laughs> Hi, you're on DBJ. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Uh, how you doing? This is uh, Bill Johnson. I wanted to ask the guys, uh, whatever happened to some of the musicians like... Uh, uh, Charlie Gabriel and some of these guys that played, you know, like in the background of a lot of the tunes. Okay. Well, the last I heard Charlie Gabriel is working with, uh, is it the Preservation Band? No, no, it's another band, another but it's band. A, a, he's a trumpet in New player. And he's out of New Orleans, and he's, right. he's traveling all in the Far East. Right, because I received a card from Charlie, what was it, just before they had the big earth earthquake. earthquake. Mm -hmm. And uh, he left the day before it happened. He was happened. in Taipei. Okay, you know, right. and and the, the two other main, if you will, Funk Brothers have passed away. Uh, Eddie Brown. Uh, well, Did that was first of all. That was James Gittins, mm -hmm. and he, and in the early days, he did all of the vibe and organ work. He's on "Stop in the Name of Love." A lot of people think I was playing organ, but it wasn't. I was the piano player. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he passed away, and John Griffin took his place. And then um, next was Benny Benjamin. Then we lost James Jameson and then uh, Eddie Bongo Brown. Okay. Okay. Back to the phone lines now. More questions at home. Hi, you're on DBJ. Go ahead. Hello. Um, I'd like to ask your two guests. Um, what were their relationships with uh, the writing team of Holland, Dozier, Holland, and um, if they have any, you know, scenarios that went on back then? And um, what do they, how do they feel about Diana Ross leaving Motown? Okay. Want to tackle that one? Sure. Uh, uh, Holland Dozier Holland were actually a, a, a vocal group. Uh, well, one of them were. It was, they were singing with, with several other people. 
and they <laughs> they they were dry, they drove to uh, Atlanta for a show a couple of times with the Temptations and did other things like that. But uh, Eddie Holland was another one that did not like the stage. He had a hit record and he couldn't draw any money from it because he he had to almost have a heart attack every time he go on the stage. <laughs> And he was like a, like a robot when he got out there because he had to memorize everything he did. Great words and could, had a good voice, but he, he, he couldn't make it like that. Uh, so he went into the background. Uh, we had great rapport with, with Holland Dozier Holland because they were also musicians. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they drew on musicians for some of the ideas that they got. Everybody mm -hmm. did. Yep. Now, Dinah yeah. Ross, uh, what, what did he ask me about Dinah Well, Ross? he wanted to know about Dinah Ross leaving. Dinah Ross leaving Motown, I have personal opinions about it that I don't think... Uh, uh, <laughs> we won't, I, I like we won't tell her. No, <laughs> I, no, no I, I don't think she had any problems leaving. I think uh, she might have been glad to go, and I think everybody probably wanted to go because mm -hmm. she had gotten to the point where she was hard, hard to not deal with but sell as a Motown artist. Mm -hmm. They wanted to do bigger and better things mm -hmm. for her. And I think it was a business move, mm -hmm. truthfully. That's my thing. And then with Holland Dozier and Holland, I probably come in contact with them more uh, than Beans did because mm -hmm. they were in the studio quite a bit. And they, they had a heck of a team because now like uh, Eddie Holland did all the lyrics. Um, Lamont Dozier did a lot of the horn work. And really, Brian was the one that would come in the studio to work with the studio he musicians. Was the and producing he, of them. Right. He run the board, too. Right. Let me ask you about this. Barry Gordy. Hear a lot about the man who built Motown, being tight-fisted, iron fist, clapping down on everybody. What's your memory of Barry Gordy? Well, my personal memory of Barry, Barry was very, very good to me. You know. Now, a lot of people felt like they were at Motown, they felt like they were mistreated. But... Barry had a thing about the musicians. He didn't allow anyone to bother the funk brothers. Mm -hmm. Now that was it. Now, as far as monies, whenever we wanted money, we had no problems. All we had to do was, we had a, we, it was like a pipeline we had to do the Barry, and that was through his secretary. Whenever we wanted anything, we just went to see Rebecca. And, and the thing is, and it's no secret that you guys made musician-wise, maybe not the artist at that time, but musicians took home a good little chunk after a while with the, mm -hmm. The other session. The Funk Brothers took home a good little chunk. <laughs> <laughs> Not other musicians. Not other musicians. <laughs> no. Okay. The Funk Brothers. Let, uh, let's see if we can go to the phones. i got a couple of questions for you, but I want to give people at, uh, at home an opportunity. Hi, you're on DBJ. Go ahead. Yes, uh, my name is um, Daryl. Mm -hmm. I was calling concerning about um, Marvin Gaye. Okay. Okay. His early years, when he was um, starting off, he was in love with Tammy Terrell. I believe ever since Tammy Terrell died, he was going through changes. He went through changes. Okay. What's your question? I like to know. Um, you know, is that's I believe that's the cause. You think that's the turning point? Yeah. Okay. Let's find out. Either one of you, gentlemen. Well, there was no. There was love between Marvin and Tammy, but not an intimate love. You know, I do know this. So you know. a sisterly love. Yes. A yeah. sisterly type love. He yeah. loved her because she was a great artist. Yes, she was. And he really loved her for that, and she worked well with him. But, I mean, he had other love in his mind <laughs> but for, at that time, intimate love. Mm -hmm. That was some other, some other persons. I want to get to my Randy's Black Bottom, but before I do, I want to ask you something. Now, Mr. Van Dyke, you said in, in one of the books that Valerie Simpson was one of the most talented people at she Motown. Was bar none, right. but certainly she didn't reach the same heights at that time as other stars. There was a problem sometimes with favoritism and pushing the right people, was there not? And, and was that because there were just so many people? Well, there were so many people until uh, they had like a roster. And certain, produce, certain producers were assigned. Well, no, they weren't assigned. They Everybody chose. got a shot. Yeah. Right. Everybody got a shot. At whatever artist, whose ever turn it was, you know, well, they they had they liked to uh, work go with a winner. If uh, I, I remember certain instances that I had to pull some producers aside and say, "Look here, here's a good group. Work with this group for right. a while. Let's see if we can get some work for them." That came from management. 
and I was working in management at that time. I said, here's a, some people that everybody's over, uh, missing. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's get some work. Well, who do you see as an unsung hero there at Motown? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Plain and simple. It's just very simple. I'm one of the few that came away from there without even a letter of credit. And, and both of, <laughs> but, but both of you all had some problems in terms of wanting to record. You, you have a love for jazz. You both have a love Let for jazz. Let me say, you you, this is a point I want to make. Motown, like all other corporations, put you where you, they think you can do the most good. And they don't want you to cross those lines. Right. If I, I, I had a very bad time getting out of my office, going down and playing in the studio. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't want me being in the studio. Because if I got a hit record, I'm coming out of there. Mm -hmm. They needed me in the office. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so they wanted you right there. I want to get to Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Then we'll come back mm -hmm. to close the show on more Motown memories. You're in a hit right now. I mean, we're talking about passes. You're in a hit right now at the Attic Theater. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the play? Well, the play, as far as I can see, is based around the musicians, actually, the four musicians. It's, and uh, maybe Beans can explain it a little better. Okay. Than okay. I can. Well, the, uh, it's, it's based on the four musicians, and it, it's, it's a recording studio uh, where Ma Rainey did uh, her recordings. And... It's and she was a famous blues singer for people who might not know the, in the right. right. She was the, okay. the one that taught Bessie Smith. They might be more familiar with Bessie Smith. Mm -hmm. But she was the forerunner of Bessie Smith. And she uh, was in a studio, I think, is supposed to supposedly paramount. Mm -hmm. But uh, at that time, the racism was kind of tough. And she was a strong lady that didn't stand for no BS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she went straight out. You, uh, you are playing the standing room uh, crowds only. We've got a little clip while we continue to talk about it. Let's take a look at that if we can. And let me ask you, this is your first true crack at actually yes, acting. Yes. That was frightening for you, I'm sure. <laughs> let me tell you, we got we were at, <laughs> on the preview, we walked around on that stage a long time before we got to the script. We was trying to remember <laughs> it. Was, and everybody was soaking wet when they got to mm -hmm. <laughs> It was kind of tough. It was tough. Does it, does, does it bring back not only uh, memories, certainly, of the, the, the 20s and people, for you, for, for jazz lovers, that kind of music, but while you're sitting there in the studio, does it bring back those Motown memories of sitting in the studio and jamming and, and things of that nature? Well, mm. I predate Motown a little bit, so it brings back another <laughs> a, 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 yes. a, a few more ideas mm -hmm. to Same me. Same thing here. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. I, I was playing music before Motown, and right. in fact, I, my sister had a rooming house for musicians in Indiana when I, where I was born. And I met all the musicians that came through the town because they couldn't stay in the, in the white hotels. So I got a chance to grow up in that atmosphere, and I got a chance to see all the beautiful people. Okay. Let me get back to the phone lines real okay. quick and give some folks at home a chance. Hi, you're on DBJ. Go ahead. Uh, yes. I saw Maureen in uh, Black Bottom okay. uh, Sunday before last, mm -hmm. and what bothered me. Okay, I love jazz and all the black music and all that, but they did more arguing among themselves and using profanity that was just beyond the human imagination. And what I cannot understand is in 1987, why would uh, a play like that come out during Martin Luther King's uh, birthday celebration okay. time? that was so negative and so uh, uh, it, it, it was just Okay, let's let's give them a chance to answer this. And to be fair, they didn't write the play; they're performing in it. But yeah, as best right. you can answer that kind of thing, I remember, either one of you. I remember speaking to this lady on Sunday in the matinee, and she's got a valid point, but she's shorting her history. She wanted me to say, well, why didn't history start with Martin Luther King? We've got our history. We've got to do our history as it is. And prior to, if she's ever been backstage, she'll hear that kind of audience. If she goes <laughs> down right. on, on Woodward Avenue or down on Michigan Avenue, she's going to hear the same thing. If she's involved in the high schools, she's going to hear the same That's thing that we're right. talking and she's going to also see the stabbing and the fighting and the everything else. And she's got to face the realities of, of the life that we live. This is where we get some of our soulful thing. She can go all the way back to Africa and find the same things. Mm -hmm. In fact, the show of, of, of Ma Rainey does explicitly talk about some of the African heritage. Mm -hmm. And 
and correlate some of the things. You cannot That's stop right. with, the, with, 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 with the use of the language when it's an everyday occurrence in all of our lives. Okay. Let me ask you something else. Um, or should I go to the phones one time before I answer it? Eh, they say give or take. Let's give some folks at home a chance. Hi, you're on DBJ. Go ahead. Yes, my name is Patricia Smith, and I was wondering why is uh, Gary Moore uh, is selling Motown? Why is Barry, Barry. Barry Gordy selling Motown? Yes. Any of you gentlemen talked to Barry <laughs> no, recently? No, but no. I, in the back of my mind, I don't feel Barry is selling Motown. Mm-hmm. Well, well they, now there certainly have been, you know, reports. True. Well, well, but they said they would let you know within two weeks, mm-hmm. a month ago, right? Mm-hmm. We haven't heard anything, have we? Mm-hmm. Well, I'll say this: that the, every every uh, offer that I've heard him having always wanted Joe Bet, and if he sells Joe Bet, he's not smart as I thought he was. That's uh, a record so company. That, no, that's, that's the, the publishing, oh, the publishing company. company. I'm sorry. See, everybody wants Stevie the publishing and, company. And, that's got uh, everybody from Smokey Motown and everybody. In it. And Smokey, right. Smokey alone has a hundred hits. Not a, not the, all the songs he's written. I mean, a hundred mm-hmm. hits. And so why would he sell that when he'll be draw? He's his grand, great grandchildren. Well, what about Stevie? Them? And you mm-hmm. have to think about people like Shorty Long. Yeah. You know, and there's so many people that had have hit, hits in there. That's still up being played. Mm-hmm. That's right. And okay. I don't think he's going to sell it. I think he needed some publicity, so he he made that deal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Quickly, one more phone call, uh, or a couple more, if we can get them in. Hi, you're on GBJ. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to know the reason for Florence Ballot leaving uh, the Supremes or being put out of the Supremes. Okay. Well, you were in management. Well, who knows? All I can say is that uh, in every family, there is always disagreement. And when you have disagreement, uh, sometimes you have to go away and, and, and think about it. And sometimes you say things you, you're sorry for. And sometimes you say, well, I don't need this. I'm going to go on out and do such and such a thing. And somebody said, well, you should go on out there. And then you say, well, I got to go in. So, right. I mean, it happens in the best of families. Mm-hmm. I think Benson Ford was having a little trouble with Henry Ford, wasn't he? <laughs> so all, all I'm saying is that... Uh, uh, it was an unfortunate situation, mm-hmm. and I think they all love each other yet. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let me ask you something, Mr. Van Dyke. The, the music you hear today, mm-hmm. what is called rhythm and blues, you have so many artists who are homogenizing their sound, if you will, trying to cross over. Is that a mistake? Um, to ask me something like that, I, I work in the public school system, you know, and I find out that... Uh, Musicians that are coming along now, they don't have the correct foundation. This is as far as I'm concerned. And I am really a jazz fanatic. But before I learn how to play jazz, I had to learn the classics and different things. And the, the, the youth today, they, they, don't, they don't go into that, mm-hmm. you know. So I, I would rather not even comment on that. Well, I, I don't mind commenting on it. I think, <laughs> first of all, that the, uh, the musicians today very few of them think in terms of the artistic and cultural aspects of the music. They go for the dollar. And the dollar's a few. It's just like playing basketball. You know, I mean, you, maybe you'll make it, maybe you won't. If you stub your toe, you can't jump off the ground. So, I mean, your career is over. In music, you got to play. You must play if you love music. You, if you're acting, you got to act. you got to speak. you got to write. You, whatever it is. And you don't care if you get any money. You would like to make a living on it. If you can make a living on it, then you feel like you've done wonders. But the artistic quality hasn't been, has, has been removed from making and replaced with making money. And that's not the criteria to be an artist. You have to be happy or you would be sad. And either one of those are important ingredients in an artistic endeavor. Let me ask you something. Who was your favorite Motown artist? That's kind of hard to say. Uh, my favorite has always been like the Four Tops, always. I guess it's because like in age we were close together. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then, well, Steve has always been my secret love because like, I remember one day we come into the studio and they said that uh, Mr. Bowles would like to see us. So we had to go over to management and we wanted to find out well, what did Mr. Bowles want. He wanted the four Funk Brothers, which was Robert White, James Jameson, William Benjamin, and myself. 
So when we go over there, he had a meeting with us. He said, I want you guys to teach Stevie how to play each one of the instruments. So I would have to say Stevie was more of my love because, like, we take him in the studio and uh, we taught him everything that we could possibly teach him. And, and you certainly made you proud there. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. What about you? Who's your favorite? That's hard to say. I, 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 I like so many of them. I like... I, I, I like to look at them and see them do something. I mean, I, I didn't get a lot of money at Motown, but I sure got a lot of joy. I was one of the guys that said, hey, when the guys come to me and say, what, what, they want me to sign up here, I said, hey, this is the first place that you're going to get a chance to do everything you need to do. Go in there and do something with it. Uh, musicians, otherwise, I mean, like Pepper and all guys, the jazz guys came to me. I said, this is a young company with a young, a young man at the beginning that's got a lot of foresight. Go and jump in there and do something. Well, I'm the old man, you know, at, at, at that time. So uh, when they went in there and started producing and they get into problems, they come holler at me. And I say, hey, just hang with it. Just go on and make it. And they made money. And I'm just as proud as if I was making the money. We were the only ones that, uh, that should I say that, uh, Barry held back. Okay. No. no, he wouldn't let them go on the he road. Wouldn't he wouldn't let them do other things. He didn't no. even want to make It was a thousand dollar fine okay. at that time if we were caught recording with anybody else. Right, thank you so much for joining us, and we greatly appreciate it, both of you. We close tonight with Classic Motown. This is The Tempting Temptations, backed by Earl Van Dyke and others, and the way you do the things you do. Talk to you next Monday. Good night. Pop acts and put together a Motor Town review and make a variety show out of it. That was the real plan. It not never got any farther than the Motor Town review. But you had so many people on that thing. A lot of <laughs> egos, I'm sure. Not at that stage. Not at no. that stage. But first of all, uh, to reflect back on what Earl said, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't just the artist that was a family. The whole operation was a family. We had we had a, a, a rapport that no other organization I've ever been associated with has ever had. That includes fraternalism. I, this thing was so tight, I mean, you couldn't even, t nobody couldn't even talk about another artist outside of Motown, mm -hmm. you know, without True. having some real problems, because we loved everybody. Now, the first artist was Marv Johnson, mm -hmm. and that's when I got my first problem. I was a road manager there, and uh, as he developed, uh, I came back home and uh, uh, went into the office because Ms. Edwards needed, was, was glad of uh, the, way, the work that I had on. Let me, let me see if I can get you to share some memories about some of the people who mm -hmm. went on and subsequently became superstars. Marvin Gaye, you had a close relationship with yes, Marvin Gaye, did very, you know? very close, very close. Marvin and I were, well, I guess I, 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 he, he kind of respected me for being able to tell him a few things. And uh, he was a young guy, you know, and he was confused. He, had, he was doing a lot of things, and he wasn't happy with everything that, had, that he was doing. He wasn't pleased with the money he was getting. He wasn't pleased, he, he wasn't pleased with his life. He had turmoil. And uh, we couldn't pinpoint it at that time. We just said, oh, well, he, he'll be all right, you know. And we kept working because he took all his anguish out in music. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he did a lot of things. But see, he had a fear of the stage. Nobody never knew. He didn't like to perform. Mm -hmm. He would stay in the studio all the time, but he did not like to go out on the stage. And he definitely didn't like to dance. True. He wanted to be a, a balladeer. And...
Good evening, I'm Ed Gordon. Tonight we talk with two men who helped write one of the biggest pages in black musical history. Earl Van Dyke and Thomas Beans Bowles have been called two of the men most responsible for the success of Motown Records. We'll talk with these gentlemen about the glory days of Motown and it's about Diana Ross, Barry Gordy, Marvin Gaye, or any other favorite Motown memory. Gentlemen, thanks very much for being here tonight. And I saw both of you laughing <laughs> when we talked about the success of Motown Records. And certainly we all know the part that Barry Gordy played in building it, but there were the foot soldiers, if you will, and certainly you two uh, are, are one of them, uh, the cornerstones, if you will. Mr. Van Dyke, you were called the architect of the Motown sound by many. You and what you called the Funk Brothers made the sound that uh, so many people loved and enjoyed. That's correct. That is me. What kind of feeling do you get from that? Well, I never thought that when we were doing the records that it would be, uh, here we are 20 years later and it sounds better to me now than ever did before. And especially when we were in the studio recording, you know, we had no idea. You said, a uh, quote from you in uh, Where Did Our Love Go, which was a book written by Nelson mm -hmm. George last year. In the early days, we were a family. It really was a, a feeling of family back then, wasn't it? Yes, it was, because we were very, very close. Well, we didn't have but uh, two buildings, I think it was, right? One building. <laughs> that wasn't selling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you, uh, Mr. Van Dyke, now, you and we mentioned the, the Funk Brothers, uh, James Jamerson, and... Uh, Benny Benjamin and, and, and you folk uh, just laid down what became gospel at that time in the 60s. I mean, that was the sound. One of the things that I find interesting in, in doing the reading that I did, because I read a number of books last year on Motown, was that you all kind of saw yourself as the musicians at that time. Yeah. And then there were the artists, like you were saying, right. you know, like the Supremes. I mean, they were that, there was a difference there in your minds, where, was there not? True. Uh, that's... Uh, the only thing I, you know, I was just wrapped up into the music thing. Now, this, the funny thing was at the time, Beans and I were working together with the Lloyd Price Orchestra, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I will never will forget, well, the first act that I ran into was Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. And they came out, you know, and we, I know we laughed at them. We really <laughs> did, sincerely, you know. Because we laughed at the music, the way the music was written and everything. But... Uh, being professional musicians, what we did was we just took the music and rearranged it so it sounded right. Now, we had a 14-piece orchestra, and maybe they came out there with a six-piece arrangement. Okay. Yeah. You laughed at, and, and, and let, let it be known, everybody laughed at the Supremes for a long time, did, when they were the primettes and they couldn't buy a hit. What about the Supremes? Now, a lot of people want to know about Diana Ross and what she was like. And Mary, we had Mary Wilson on some months ago, and she came on and talked about her book and, and talked about uh, Diana and Flo and everybody. What were they like? Well, I didn't really come in contact with them until we started doing things like I went out. We went to Europe, right, because I actually, Kim Weston and my group, we pioneered uh, Europe so the Motown Review could come over. But other than that, as far as the Supremes, uh, I guess Beans could tell you more about that than I could. Because, see, he was in management, and he, uh -huh. he really came in closer contact with them. Okay, I've heard about you musicians, though. Those were three pretty ladies. I bet you know more than you're telling. We'll go no. to phone lines right now. <laughs> Hi, you're on DBJ. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Hello, how you doing? This is uh, Bill Johnson. I wanted to ask the guys, uh, whatever happened to some of the musicians like... Uh, uh, Charlie Gabriel and some of these guys that played, you know, like in the background of a lot of the tunes. Okay. Well, the last I heard Charlie Gabriel was working with, uh, is it the Preservation Band? No, no, it's another band, but another it's band. a, a, a trumpet player. And he's out of New Orleans, and he's, right. he's traveling all in the Far East. Right, because I received a card from Charlie, what was it, just before they had the big Death earthquake. earthquake. Mm -hmm. And uh, he left the day before it happened. He was in Taipei. Okay. Go over there. And and the, the two other main, if you will, Funk Brothers have passed away. Uh, Eddie Brown. Uh, well, there was first of all there was James Gittins, mm -hmm. and and in the early days he did all of the vibe and organ work. He's on Stop in the Name of Love. A lot of people think I was playing organ, but it wasn't. I was the piano player. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he passed away, and John Griffin took his place. And then um, next was Benny Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Then we lost James Jameson and then uh, Eddie Bongo Brown. Okay. Okay. Back to the phone lines now. More questions at home. Hi, you're on DBJ. Go ahead. 
Hello. Um, I'd like to ask the two guests. Um, what were their relationships with uh, the writing team of Holland Dozier Holland, and um, if they have any, you know, scenarios that went on back then? And um, what do they? How do they feel about Diana Ross leaving Motown? Okay. Want to tackle that one? Sure. Uh, uh, Holland Dozier Holland were actually a, a, a vocal group. Uh, well, one of them were. It was they were singing with with several other people. And they, they, they were dry, they drove to uh, Atlanta for a show a couple of times with the Temptations and did other things like that. But uh, Eddie Holland was another one that did not like to stage. He had a hit record and he couldn't draw any money from. I'm sorry, <laughs> one building, and so uh, and then we branched out to two. But we used to do things like uh, on the weekend we would go to uh, maybe to uh, Barry's secretary's house and stay there all weekend, and we would. Maybe we play poker, quarter limit. I mean, it's very, very close, you know. And we. One other thing, and then we'll get some of Mr. Bowles' memories. When you looked around at that time and saw a Smokey Robinson, a Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, Temptations, did you know, I mean, really, did you know that you had something special there? Well, coming from the point of working in the studio, we really didn't come in contact with them that much. We come in contact more with Stevie and Marvin because they were musicians. But like, uh, the only time we see Smokey and the rest of them, like, well, Smokey was a producer, but the other artists, we never saw them because like we would make the tracks and then they would come in and dub after we leave. Now, Mr. Bowles, you had an interesting setup with Motown Records. You signed on as an artist in 62, a saxophonist. Yeah, yeah. But then you became road manager for one of the most certainly memorable things that Motown has left us, the Motown Review. You were the babysitter, if you will, of all these people. What, what was that like? Well, uh, I was the creator of Motown Review. It was first called the Motortown Special. That was my assignment when I first went to Motown, was to try to, try to pull something together. They had a few shows, but they weren't going like... Uh, Barry had a feel for. So he hired me because I'd been in involved at the shows with the Flame Show Bar for so long. And I had quite a bit of experience in pulling the show together. So I spent six months developing first the Motortown special. And uh, unfortunately, I got hurt on the tour. And it ended up being the Motortown Review. The idea was to have the Motortown special, the Gospel Train, a jazz liner. And out of each one of these, you pull the, the, the top.